Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. I would like to introduce you to our presenter for today, Bianca Bauman. Bianca is a senior learning strategist and director of learning experience at GP Strategies, focusing on our digital education success, combining L&D and digital marketing to create outstanding learning experiences and strategies that help organizations meet their growth and revenue targets. She is also the author of the published ebook, The Little Black Book of Marketing and L&D, a practical guide that helps integrate uh, proven marketing techniques into L&D. So we have a great session planned for today. So with that, Bianca, I am going to pass the baton to you and let you take over and the floor is all yours. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kim, for this introduction. Welcome everyone to this webinar. Very excited to spend the next 20 to 30 minutes with you, depending on how many questions you have. We're going to talk about what actually is human centered design and what is human centered design in comparison to design thinking. It often is used interchangeably, but there is a small but mighty difference. And then I want to give you some actionable tips on how you can be more human centric as you go through your designs. So, first off, I want to tell a little story around a drill. No one needs to actually purchase a drill because no one wants to have the drill lying around. We do purchase the drill because we need to drill a hole. Sometimes it even goes further because we don't just have to drill that hole. We actually need to hang a shelf or hang a picture. And it could even go further than that because maybe your better half has been nagging you for the longest time to actually hang that picture. What I'm trying to get at is everyone has a different reason why they need a drill. And we in uh, when we use human centered design coupled with design thinking, it is really all about understanding why someone needs a drill because everyone has a different need and it really drives the point of relevance. So, as we think about human centered design and design thinking, we have to identify what is relevant to our learners and really truly understand what they need the drill for. So, human centered design is designing with the end user, not only for the end user. And that is something that differentiates it from design thinking. So we're really including our learners the entire time. We don't just put them first, which obviously is extremely important, but we really uh, tie them in throughout the entire process. And of course, I'm going to tell you how we can do that. Just a real quick comparison, and when it says traditional here, so that is really, you know, almost more of um, a, a mix of Addy and Waterfall. But, you know, as we think about human centered design, it helps us to focus on driving better experiences for our users or learners. We can build resilience and de risk innovation. What I mean by that is innovation can be scary and messy. It's great, but at the same time, you know, it, it might make us a little uncomfortable and using and focusing on human centered design helps us de-risk that a little bit. And of course, we can invest in employees and customer and community experiences. Another difference here is human centered design, not just focuses on the employee in our case, the learner, but also on the customer. What do we do for our employee that then affects the customer and how affect how does that affect the community overall? So you see, it goes much, much further than the design thinking piece. So traditionally, if you think about, you know, learner target audience analysis, it's somewhat abstract and fixed. Whereas when we do human centered design, we use personas much more dynamic and we include our users in the design. And you see the word users here, right? Um, this, this information is from an IBM study. So they use the word user for us. It would be the learner. Um, measurement, we want to measure, traditionally we measure relevant to what's for the organization, but now we want to shift that with human centered design and measure what's relevant to the users, meaning the learners, customers, and our community, right? Much, much broader. 
if you think about approval processes that we usually go through, we need a lot of approvals for even minor decisions in a more traditional run organization. But if we tie in human centered design, not just in our uh, practice as learning and development professionals, but overall, we empower employees to learn through their own actions. When you look at teams, um, homogeneous teams, very traditional way of looking at it, very job based, very role based versus if you think about a human centered driven organization, much more diverse and inclusive teams. And we've seen this over the last couple of years for sure that we shift more towards skill based training, right? Because people are employees are put together into project teams that they work on instead of the traditional marketing team and sales team, right? We cross uh, cross train them or we leverage them based on projects. So human centered design does exactly that. And so from a project perspective, waterfall, very, very traditional. Whereas now, if you are a human centered organization, it's more iterative. Uh, you're developing ideas, making decisions, delivering outcomes in a much, much more agile way. So just quick overview here to set the stage. Uh, already shared a whole bunch of points around what human centered design is and what design thinking is and what it isn't. So let's go a little deeper here. So human centered design is really a mindset and a tool that you would apply alongside design thinking. So they complement each other really, really, really well and create a long term impact for the users of our solution. And if you think about users, you know, it could be the learners, but we want to think bigger. It could be our customers. It could be the community overall. Human centered design has three phases, inspiration, ideation, and implementation. So inspiration is all about immersing yourself in the life of the people that you're designing for. So we can really understand their needs. What do they need to drill for, right? Ideation is about interpreting what you've learned in that first phase and then identifying solutions and prototyping potential solutions. And then implementation, of course, is you're bringing your solution to life and you bring it to the market, to the people. And if, uh, as you see here, diverge and converge, what that reverse refers to is divergent really means we have a number of possible ideas that we create. So we're really, you know, brainstorming, putting all the good ideas out there, the crazy ideas. And then as we go into the converged um, part of the, of the graph, that is where we refine and narrow down the best ideas, right? So that is what a team would be going through as they leverage the, the three phases of human-centered design. Design thinking has these five iterative steps that most of us have probably seen by now, but so we start with empathizing with our audience. So we really learn about who they are, what drives them, what the need is, how we can create relevance for them. Then we define the problems that they're facing in usually a form of problem statements. Uh, so there could be answering the five Y, W's, it could be um, answering, you know, there's different forms of, of how you can create problem statements. Um, so this is what you would go through there. And it's best to have a couple of problem statements that you brainstorm and then, you know, refine them as you go through the process. But when we define these problem statements, we define them from a learner point of view. So what is the learner persona's problem, right? Then we ideate third step here and brainstorm and create solutions. And before we move into the prototype phase where we build representation on one or more of our ideas. And then of course we go out and test it. This looks somewhat linear, but it's by no means linear. It's very, very iterative and agile because as you test, you'll probably realize, oops, something is not working the way we thought it is. So I actually have to go back to possibly define, ideate, maybe, maybe even to my learner persona in the first step and empathize again, because I made a mistake. I thought something about a learner and it doesn't hold true, right? So you're constantly going back updating, making changes. So it can be messy, uh, but it's also a great experience to really put your learners first. So as we put these two concepts together, this is what it looks like. So there's a lot of information on here and we're going to break it out over the next couple of slides, 
but uh, you can you can see that uh, you know you have the five different stages of the design thinking, empathize, define, idea, prototype, and then the test kind of circles around the entire human centered design because we're testing on a regular basis, making sure our assumptions are correct. So let's break this down into each of these phases a little bit more. So first off, though, from a human centered design uh, standpoint, before we start the five stage design thinking process, you really need to have a very optimistic mindset. You need to be open to solutions that you're going to discover and, you know, that the solution lies in the population we were, where, where we were trying to serve. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is. Don't go in with a predefined idea of what the learning solution looks like. Human centered design and design thinking works best if you actually don't know what the solution is and you're trying to figure it out together with your learners. And of course, with all the different stakeholders as well. So the 1st stage here, the empathize slash inspiration. That is really where, you know, we, we, we begin with understanding people and trying to focus on a definable problem uh, that this group of people has. And during this stage in human centered design reminds us that this is the inspiration phase where we do not want to rush to get to the execution. Let's take our time to really understand who our learners are. And that enables us to more fully understand the people we're trying to serve. And it's also, you know, an ethical method of really keeping our learners in mind and how we can get there. So a couple of ways of how you can fully understand your, your learners and your people is, of course, learner personas. I already mentioned that a typical representation of your learners that you can create using um, interviews. You can use observations. You can talk to managers, stakeholders, use some assumptions there, data that you have available, and you create those learner profiles. You could go even further, get a little bit more creative and create photo journals. So what, what I mean by that is take pictures of what this learner might see, what they're surrounded by, and just make it fun, right? Kind of have your arts and crafts going on here and create a journal that shows in pictures what a learner is going through, what they feel. And uh, you could also have a guided office or now a home tour. Very similar idea, but you know, you really get a feel for um, who the learners are. This could be a video, for example, and leverage that to better understand what your learners are faced with every day. Again, really, really important that you include them into everything. So don't just make assumptions. You always want to run it by them to make sure they see themselves in the personas that you create in those photo journals or the guided office or home tours. As we go into the second phase, design thinking recommends that you frame one problem that you can then meaningfully design towards. And on top of this, human centered design actually guides us to converge stakeholders to better understand their needs and assets and opportunities to really align around some of the common and shared problems. And one way of doing that is problem statements. I already mentioned that. Uh, you could use how might we statements. So how these work together is you come up with the problem statement first. So a learner persona um, Bob is facing X, Y, Z issue, right? And then the how might we statements are how might we help Bob to solve this issue, right? So they kind of go hand in hand. And it's really great because um, as, as humans, you know, if we ask a question, we always want to find an answer to it. So it's just a great way of flipping things on its head while keeping the user at the center of everything we do. You could also use insight statements or aha learning moments. Those are often things you get out of your learner persona interviews. What was one of those aha moments the last time you took a learner, uh, a learning offering that we have, right? So great way to get uh, inspired and define what it is your learners really, really need. All right. The third stage now is the ideation. Idea and ideation is the same for both design thinking and um, human centered design. Goal come up with as many ideas as possible and not just the right ideas, right? Think about creative processes on how you can actually generate more ideas in partnership with your learners. So it's great to do this with stakeholders, but again, bring your learners into the fold as well. So you could use your arts and crafts again and uh, create a collage or actually draw something out. 
I know people are so hesitant to draw because, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm not great at drawing, but it's actually a great way to be creative and, and think about possible solutions. Another option is a mashup. I'm not sure if you if you heard about that one before. It's about isolating first the, the exact quality that you're looking to design in your solution. So, um, for example, um, and then you want to overlay like a really bold, unreasonable question on top. So, for example, you know, you could ask yourself if you're trying to design a, a healthy school lunch, you want to ask what's the farmer market version of a cafeteria? Or if you want to determine how to make a financial services model more social, you might want to ask what's the Facebook version of saving of a savings account? So the trick is to layer a real world example of whatever quality you seek, right? That you want to design. So it's a fun way of just you know looking at that. Um, I had a great by accident. It happened the other day. I was talking to a client and they were saying, well, I wish I could just clone my colleague because that would be fantastic. She has all the answers. I was like, great. How are we going to clone her? Clearly we can't clone a person quite yet, but we came up with fantastic ideas with thinking about how we can clone someone, right? So mash things up a little bit to help you get there. And no idea is too crazy, believe me. Sometimes the, the craziest ideas actually make it in the end. Then we move into the prototype phase. So design thinking is telling us to develop a minimal viable product to see if the solution is actually going to be adopted in uh, the market that we're going to release it in. So our learner, uh, our learners. And human-centered design just has some tools in this implementation phase uh, that, uh, you know, that helps you create those prototypes, again, in partnership with your key stakeholders and your end users so you can get feedback. So this could be role plays, you're playing something out. It could be visual prototypes that could be at the back of a napkin, but you can also use tools such as Envision that are really, really great to do this digitally. Or you can create stories using again digital or analog tools. The stories are a great way to prototype and implement something. So it doesn't always have to be that minimal viable product in terms of hey, it's a it's a learning solution that you know is functional at this stage, but it could really something be something that's you know not even fully flushed flushed out yet in a digital world, but it gives you an idea of how your users, your learners would actually use it in the end, in the long run. And then of course, the last stage here is, is test, uh, testing your prototype to identify, you know, is this actually going to work? What makes sense? And what can we actually do to make it better? And one way of validating prototypes is usability testing. So you have users actually go through the experience and see what works and what doesn't work and you know, ask them specific questions. And of course, pilot, pilots, pilots and a bit of testing is what you could use here as well. So that was a lot of information. Now you might wonder, okay, this is all great. How can I actually be more human centric? Of course, following these ideas, but it's not that easy, right? It takes some practice. It's art and a science, so start small. But a couple of ideas that might help you become more aware is Identify ways to include community in everything you do. So not just thinking about the learners, but the overall community, right? How does that affect your training solutions, your learning solutions? Have everyone asked the right questions about how their work affects the end user? And I know, again, it sounds easy, but it takes some practice, but really, really crucial to think about the how the work and the work environment and the work, the work are all fit together and asking those those right questions. Switch your thinking from business problem to human problem. I have two examples here. How can we lower the number of customer service calls, very business driven, to how can we keep our product from frustrating users? Another example, how can we grow our customer base, business driven, versus how can we satisfy our customers so they become advocates for us, more human centered. And simply look at the world around you, deconstruct products and services you use every day and you know that maybe have been created in a human centered way. Or you could also say, oh, actually, there's something they could have done better to make your experience more delightful. So just a couple of very small action items to help you focus and become more aware of human centered design. And with that, we're at the end of our 20 minute slot and I welcome any questions or comments.
Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. That was great. Uh, it was a great presentation. We are at the end of the hour, but I want to make sure that if there are any questions that we answer them. Um, and uh, before we go, um, so I see a comment here yes, saying, yes. thank you. It's so nice to know that people are being educated, rightly so, on the exact way I used to design, test, and implement systems. I'm so happy to hear, Paula, that you've been using this in the past already. And yeah, you know, it's I, I really see the advantages when we work with our clients. Sometimes we have to educate our clients first, our internal clients, right, to understand the different processes. And it seems like at times we spend all this time in the beginning and where's the solution and where's the content, right? But once we get through this initial phase, we hit the ground running and you design better and faster in the long run. So thank you for putting in that comment for everyone. Um, I do have a, a quick question. Oh, here comes a question too. Yeah. Um, how uh, do you so, combat a rush? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah. It's, sorry, Kim. I'm getting excited about the question. So yeah, question here is how do you combat a rush to solution when working with stakeholders? That is a tricky one for sure. Um, and this is going back to what I was just saying, that education piece, right? So ideally, I would start. First, if you want to use design thinking and human centered design, I would start with a project that doesn't have a million eyes on it. I would start with something smaller that, uh, and it sounds maybe kind of productive, but that doesn't have, you know, a high impact because that is where you can de risk innovation, right? This is where you can try things out and show your stakeholders like, hey, if we do it this way, we actually will see better results, right? So don't try to do it with something that has a lot of eyes on it and that, you know, it's really business and mission critical. In my experience, it works better to help you educate your stakeholders. And sadly, the proof is in the pudding. So what I mean by that is you have to uh, go through those hard experiences in the beginning to show your stakeholders, but that continuous education uh, sharing resources, maybe even this webinar um, and, and articles to really help them understand that there is a better way of designing and design thinking and human centered design is one of them. So, yeah, it takes practice to to educate your stakeholders. I hope that's an OK answer for you. I, I wish I had a more black and white answer, but uh, there uh, there isn't. Uh, Lisa is saying here, great content, just right. I have a lot of ideas to take action on. Perfect. And yes, you will re receive the deck and the recording. Uh, good information, Melissa says. Uh, nicely melt together for the best outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Laura is also saying on the topic of measurement, can you talk a little bit more about your process to include end users in that and getting their supervisor approval to include them? Yes. So, um, when you say measurement, um, so I'm not quite sure. Are you talking about measurement overall for the solution? I assume, uh, and I'm going to answer. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. So that is something uh, at GP. We always start with the end in mind. So we really truly understand what are the strategic goals, the business outcomes but how they also relate to um, the, the learners in the end. So that is an exercise we always go through first. And that is usually also an easy way to get stakeholders involved because they understand measures, they understand KPIs, right? And once we have them on our, on our side around that, it then is rather easy to get approval to include the learners as well, because now the stakeholders really see the advantages that our process can bring and starting with the end in mind specifically. So we use a process called measurement mapping. If you want to Google that or um, you know, we have a ton of information on that on, on our website as well. So Bonnie Bears Ford created the measurement mapping uh, methodology. And again, we're looking at uh, or starting with the end in mind. And we're looking at leading indicators. What are some of the indicators that tell us we will do well with our strategic um, goals and, and business objectives? So uh, that usually works really well. So once you have the, the numbers and have them included, they usually say yes to get the learners included as well. And it has to fit obviously into everyone's schedule. So you have to work around that for sure. So hope that answers the question. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Bianca. We're a little bit running a little past time. So mm -hmm. if there's no other questions, I say we can wrap up today's session. And I just wanna thank you 
Bianca, for your time and your expertise and everyone who attended for your time and attention as well. We hope you'll join us again for one of our upcoming sessions. You can go to gpstrategies.com under webinars to find our upcoming and archived sessions. And I wish everyone on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your day. Thank you. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.